Let's see if we can try it. There we go. Yes, sir. All right, there man. We well, I appreciate you taking time to do this interview with the Hype Magazine tonight. I appreciate it. I, I really do. I'm DJ Teflon, aka the highest yeah, DJ on the planet. No, I love I love that Georgia. tag, the highest DJ you know in, in the world, and a lot of people would want to argue that. But when you're uh, Burner's DJ and on tour with Wiz, it's kind of you know it, it makes sense. So, um, what made you get started in the music industry and pursue this as your career? Um, I was doing flyers like I, like back when ha like physical printed out flyers was big. Okay. I used to do I used to design flyers, so that was like my entry level job into well street team first but that was like my main job in the in the industry okay so great I, so I you did, did uh, graphics um how did how did you make the switch into becoming a dj uh big shout out to my homeboy felix murray co-owner of gas house um he used to own a okay. club called dreams atl and i and being there every day doing the flyers, maintaining the website, stuff like that, I used to just kind of play with the equipment. And one day he kind of pulled me to the side and was like, you know, you seem to really like this. So are you going to waste my electricity right. or are you going to take it serious? As though, the rest was now with history. you being from Atlanta, do you think it made it harder for you or easier for you to, you know, get into the, in the game? Um, I want to say it's easier because Atlanta, the music industry feeds off yeah. the party scene and vice versa. So I already have relationships with a lot of the promoters from being around for years. So it kind of made it easy once they, you know, once people seen that I was serious, it was like, oh, he's so, And then with That's you being, uh, you know, behind the scenes doing flyers and websites and stuff like that, um, what was it you think that uh, um, with your designs and stuff that got people interested in, uh, in the first place? Because there's a lot of different graphic designers out there, but you had to have done something that made uh, stand out to, you know, get all those opportunities. Um, this was during a time when it wasn't not trying mm, to be funny gotcha. watered down with a lot of graphic artists. Like, it wasn't, like, at that time, it was probably five to six people people in town you use if you wanted a dope flyer so like it wasn't as many people doing flyers because back then when it was actual yeah. physical flyers we used to get 150 to one to 150 for the yeah. for two-sided flyer design whereas right now you got people doing flyers for cheap it's 35 40 dollars even yeah. lower than that like yeah so we used to actually with physical flyers we used to actually make money yeah. It wasn't there was a lot more effort into it. You had to use, you know, Adobe Photoshop. You couldn't just do a, a magic wand and cut images out. You had to be very, uh, you know, strategic with that. So I can relate to that. Um, I had a, I have a friend that was in the graphic industry as well, and they said the same thing. Like, now it's so watered down. Everybody can do a flyer, but the people who did it in the original days, they still make the best flyers. You could have the most technology available to you, but just knowing how to actually do those techniques um, – makes you stand out like we used to have to buy like right now there's a whole bunch of websites with cut out this and cut out that and templates i used to have i used to go to the magazine store and spend 100 150 dollars on just mm. magazines to have dope images because i would have to buy the magazine scan yeah. the image and then work from there so i spent a lot of so when you made that switch, that like a lot of people knew you for the graphics, when you went to become a DJ, did you have a lot of people still coming up to you saying, hey, you know, are, are you, you going to do my flyer? Or did they understand the switch was permanent and you were uh, serious about that? I'm a little, a little bit of both. I had people still asking me, like I had one client that was just like, she hadn't used me in a while. And she needed some work then. And when I went DJ, mm -hmm. I went all DJ. I wasn't even thinking about anything graphic. <laughs> and she was like, how? how? What made you stop? You, you yeah. do such good work. You're reliable. Like, I was like, you know, I'm chasing a dream. And, and I, I want to go all in with this. Like, she had actually talked me into doing a flyer for her. Right, she became like, oh, the relying on you. And she's like, hey, I know you want to make this new life change, but I still need this flyer done. So, you know I mean, let me go ahead and get this. And that's exactly 
exactly now, what happened. Um, with you, uh, with Atlanta, you know, there's like you said, there's a lot of clubs, and we know there's a lot of strip clubs and everything like that. What was the first club or uh, opportunity you had as a DJ, and how did that experience go for you? How was that? Um, it was Mansion Elon. Uh, no, excuse me. Before then, it was Dreams, because uh, like I said, my homeboy who owned Dreams gave me the opportunity. I remember he said, "I still charge two hundred dollars." That's right. I I'm not mad at that. Um, it was the year T.I. had just got out of jail from getting locked up at the previous yes. BET Awards. So I want to say it was 14. Um, fly from T.I.G. This is before he had started T.I.G. If I'm not mistaken, Fly was turning 25. And Fly wanted a banging 25, uh, 25th party. And he threw it out joking saying he wanted Lil Wayne and T.I. for his birthday party. And they actually put the party together, and they was expecting the capacity to be so big. And you, if you know Atlanta, you know Mansion, a.k.a. Dreams, was a big place. But they, had, they, put, they got a tent outside for the overflow. And by this time, I was, you know, probably fucking around with it a strong six to eight months or whatever have you. And this night, they needed another DJ. And I remember... I asked my homeboy, and this is one of my real deal partners. He was like, I don't know. You got to ask Fly. It's his party. And I asked Fly, and Fly wow. was like, I right, bet. Just don't be in there playing no bullshit. Yeah. For a lot of people, uh, they, don't, they don't understand the, the work that goes into being a DJ. Um, you know, how did your first DJ an opportunity, like I said, don't play no BS. Like, you know, how did you know what songs to go by? Did you already have an idea what the people wanted? Did you just go with the T.I. Little Wayne set? Or what was some of your, what, what some of the records you decided to run with that night? Um, I wasn't in the main, on the main stage, so I didn't have to play like T.I. Little Wayne. Um, I can't really too mm -hmm. much tell you what I played per se, but from being in, the, now mind you, I work at a club at this time. So even prior to DJing, I'm in the club every yeah. week. So I kind of had an yeah. idea of what yeah, that's, that's a great way to do it is to get inside the club that you're going to be at eventually. So you know what your those fans like. Like They might like a certain song. And as a DJ, if you can play that song for them, it, it automatically lets them know you're one of them and they're going to have a good time. So uh, that's that's really dope. Um, I've I seen that uh, you were mentored or uh, learned by, uh, from DJ Don Cannon. Um, how did you link up with Cannon, and what made you guys decide to start working together and, you know, uh, you know, being a mentor and stuff like that? Um, okay, so before I started working for Mansion or Dreams, I worked for a company okay. called Cloud9. Big shout out to Biddy Barnes. Um, him and AG did a lot of parties together, and at one time, the affiliates and Cloud9 shared office space. So from that time there, I became cool with Don Cannon. And one, they had Cannon actually DJing at Dreams at one time because Dreams had a front room and a back room. And one night after he was leaving from work and he seen me DJing up front, and he was like, you serious? And I was like, yeah. And we already had built some kind of camaraderie from yeah. being around the Cloud9 office. So once he felt like, once he seen that I was serious, he was just like, you know, pull up on me. And use me as a well, that's an amazing opportunity because you know DJ Don Cannon, DJ Drama, you know they they legends in the music industry. So for them to see for him to see you and you know ask you if you're serious, it seems to be a running theme that people are saying, "Are you serious?" And then you say, "Yeah," and then you know it gives you those opportunities. Uh, what was one of the first things that you learned um, either from him or the other people when you decided to be a DJ um, that you you had to uh, understand or uh, learn? Um, he, he helped me to understand mm -hmm. I'm playing, I'm playing catch up. It's people that's been yeah. in this longer than I, like at this time, like funny story. This is like two or three years, maybe this is under five years into my DJ career. And it's Thanksgiving and his mother came from uh, Philly and she had cooked dinner and we over his house. And she was like, so, so baby, how long you been DJing? And I was like, and I said it all proud with my chest poked out. Like, let's say it was three years. I was like, yeah, three <laughs> years. She was like, baby, you're a novice. Must, and, and at this time, she was, I forgot. She was like, you know, my son's been mm -hmm. DJing 15, 20 years at this point. Like, 
So it, it, it helped put it like it, it put it in perspective. But the main thing I learned was, and I give this to this advice to anybody who's starting yeah. DJing: practice, practice, practice. So it you it becomes an extension. You don't think about yeah. it. It's natural reaction. The more you practice, the more it just becomes second nature. It's like oh 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 oh, and it becomes a rhythm. So I used to spend a lot. Yeah, a lot of people don't time. understand. It's not just picking songs to go together, but you got to blend them in. You got to be able to transition the right way, and you know, uh, drop do your drops and stuff like that to keep the the party going. Because if you if you have a song and it doesn't sound right when it gets blended in or moved into the next song, you can lose the crowd that way. Or yeah. even knowing. How to count bars and knowing when to bring it. Now, what was the first place outside of Atlanta that you either got to DJ or you were on tour with an artist as their DJ? Um. Okay, my first okay. DJ gig was in October. Um, that was BET weekend. That following Memorial Day, some promoters from here used to do a weekend called Urban yeah. Paradise in the Dominican Republic, and. <clears throat> I went, I DJ oh, there out the country for the first time. That was my first, that, like, that was my first abroad experience. And that was shit, not even into my career of actually having gigs. That was six to eight months wow. into my career. But, like, the, pre the previous year, I went as yeah. the person who was just going. The next year, I'm, I'm DJing. And that was my first time DJing. I think a lot of there. people, a lot of DJs miss the opportunities to go to the different conferences. So I'm glad you mentioned that, that you went overseas um, you know, and took advantage of that. What were some of the relationships or the uh, information you gained from going overseas that you might not have had if you stayed in Atlanta that, um, for that? Um, this was actually a party weekend. It wasn't even a conference. It was some promoters. It was promoters from here, New York, Houston, who did it. And... They did it for like one year before and then I think two years after. But SNS okay. they had booked him that year. And SNS was kind of just like, you know, don't rush it. Just take your time. Like you moving too fast. Enjoy the moment. Live in the moment. Like even, you know, DJs play songs real fast. It's an art to that. You don't have to play songs real fast. Like, what are you rushing for? We're out the country. So I learned from that weekend just kind of and like making the moment last you don't have to like run through songs extra fast you're not impressing right them. you don't have to try and chop them up too quick you can let the song breathe a little bit so the fans can enjoy it and then when you're overseas another thing that you get with those opportunities is you get to meet people you know when you're in atlanta you're you're there but when you're out of the country together it gives you some chances to bond and stuff like that um what were some of the the takeaways you 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 got from uh being overseas that you brought back home and uh, it, you know, did it uh, impact the way you moved after that? Um, right. I brought back Confidence. that I could do this. Because, like, okay, Sean, Sean Mack from Chicago was there, DJ Ill Will from New York, Craig G, um, yeah. SNS. And so, I, like, just being there with them and holding my own let me know that, A, I can do this this and a i can do this b i can do this on a bigger scale i just gotta work now um how did you and uh burner link up and how did you become his uh, official dj because you know he's a legend out here and you know the uh that but how to have that opportunity present itself i'm gonna roll back to my homeboy felix murray who okay um owns gas house yeah he knew burner from being in the bay all the time him and then his homeboy Phil, Mr. Nice, um, his business partner, he had passed. He was from Houston. Um, okay. Burner was actually signed to Phil when he first got started. Like, he was helping him burn, kind of get more into hip-hop, you know, in the main mainstream hip-hop world. So, like, just hanging out with Fee one, one weekend, like, one week during the week, he was like, yo, we all going to Cali, come to Cali. And I came to Cali. I stayed at Phil's house, and that's when I met Burner. And at the time, he had a DJ, and, like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Nima got a job at Apple where he could no longer be his DJ. So in 14, um, it was mm. the Smokers Club, and he needed a DJ, 
and he actually called Felix like, yo, I want Tef to come be my DJ, but I don't want to disrespect him. I don't really got much money. It's my first, you know, kind of tour. And Felix called me, like, Felix was like, all right, so when do you need him? He was like, Monday, and this was like a Saturday. <clears throat> Felix called me and was like, yo, you start tour on Monday. Oh. Bernard said you, you need a DJ, you go. And that gave me time away from Atlanta and the club and to see it on a larger scale. So I appreciate Felix for even making that happen because when I got yeah. the call, it was you're going to tour. Yeah. So there was no conversation season. about if you'll do it or can you do it. They just He just made it official, like, you're going to do this regardless of what you think. We need you. This is your opportunity. You know, let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't it was it was when I got it, it was I'm going. He don't got much money. It'll be XYZ a day for you know, for a show. That's but, dope. Now yeah, now, when that money. opportunity presented itself, were you any kind of apprehensive because the money not might not have been there, or did you see the potential and the opportunity that was ahead of you so you know you wasn't uh, stressing as much? Um, um this is legitimately yeah. Five years into my career, as a DJ, you know, the the seal that like the dream job right, is right. to be XYZ's DJ. So it was like yeah. shit, I could be somebody's DJ. Let's go. It was, and plus this, this is my homeboy, so I was like, ah right, yeah, I'm definitely that's going. dope. Now what was uh what was the first tour you and Burner did? What some of the cities or markets you got to travel together um on that tour? It was the Smokers Club tour. Mm. It was Method Man, Red Man, Be Real from Cypress Hill, us yeah, Mick, and a dude okay. named Mick Jenkins. Um, Burner and Be Real shared a tour bus. So we was yeah. on the, like, I learned how to tour from one of the greatest, from a member of one of the biggest bands yeah. in hip hop and rock culture. So I learned about being respectful and being on time and, you know, always treating the yeah. gig like it's a gig because you could easily not be making this money. So always be respectful of the job. Never be late. Be respectful to the worker. So like th those things have carried on with me since then. But it was a, um, I'm a it was like a 20 city tour. So we, we hit a, a, a lot of markets. I can't remember everyone, but like New Orleans, Philly, New York. Yep. It, it, it was a pretty decent size tour. Well, you said we hit a lot of spots. And oh my God, I think you said b row and Method Man and Red Man were headlining that tour. So I remember that tour. That was a legendary tour that went around uh, the country. So I'm sure that was a great experience. Um, were you very familiar with Burner's music uh, before you went on tour with them? Or did you guys kind of figure it out as you mm -hmm. That was my homeboy. So I, I was buying his, like, even now, I have damn near, I can't say yeah. all because Burner has a lot of projects. I always brought his albums. That's my homeboy. But before I was his DJ, and even now being his DJ, you know, now it's actually kind of hard to actually buy people's albums. They want you to stream. But, like, I always brought Burner's albums. Like, I still got the first CDs of, that he gave me of some, uh, some of his old music, Unopened. Like, I listened to yeah. just because that was my homeboy. He always, you know, showed me love and took me around California and smoked me out. So I, I always kind and so, of... And you've been, you've been DJing on. for a while, as you said. What's some of the changes that you've made as technology has advanced? You know, I mean, is there anything you're doing differently now because of the different programs are there, or you're still more, you know, vinyl records and, and you know, 16s and stuff like that? Um, I got lucky because I came mm. in at the CD phase. I came in at the... You, you had your Mac, you made some CDs and just... DJed off CDs. I okay. came in slightly yeah. before Serato. Um, what I learned is learn the learn the technology and make it work for you. It's always going to evolve, so don't get stuck at you know five updates ago, and then you know make it work for your DJing style. Everybody uses the technology different, so I've just learned to you know use so, it to make now my you know um, with you traveling around were you prepared for the amount of work that goes into those tours like a lot of people think it's all fun and games but it's a lot of hurry up and wait and you know being at the location before you you know you got to be so how did you deal with the the transition of going on tour and you know learning how the business uh, is happening um 
it was cool because I'm on the tour bus with Burner, my homeboy, and Be Real from Cypress Hill. So, like, that tour, just like every tour, <laughs> yeah. we smoke a lot of weed. So, yeah, we're there. But, yeah, we're going to sit here and get, get high and pass the time until it's time because you're right. It is a whole bunch of hurry up and wait. You get to the venue, you do sound check, back waiting again, you do the show, then it's over and you still got to wait to drive to the next city. So, I don't think people realize yeah. how much downtime it is. And, <clears throat> excuse me, also how much, like, time away from, from your regular yeah. life you, you are. Like, I, I, I'm my mother's only child. I enjoy coming to the house and not having a lot going on. But now you're on a tour bus that's nowhere bigger than yeah. your living room with seven other five yeah, other Yeah, you got to get you the get light away from. yeah. So it, 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 I don't think people realize how much it's just kind of taxing on your, 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 your mental and your body. You just sitting somewhere waiting. Now, a whole um, as you said, you started with Burner early on, but now, you know, let's fast forward 2022. They do the 420 Fest and Burner's, you know, headlining. You've got people around the whole world that's coming in town for this because now Burner's, you know, an icon out here. How, how did that transition go for you? Because you were there pretty much through the whole journey. How did how did that experience um, go on your end? All right, so my first tour, we mm -hmm. was legal in California. We was legal in Denver. And that year we was on tour, it got voted legal in Oregon. Um, so it's my first tour. I'm happy. I'm posting pictures. I'm, yeah. I'm with Be Real from Cypress Hill. I'm smoking weed. I'm having the best time. And one of my homeboys came to me and he was like, you know, I, I know you with your guy who smokes weed, but you shouldn't be advertising smoking weed so much on your page because you got to remember that somewhere, you know, you live with somewhere where weed's illegal and you might turn off right. this person and turn off that person. So yeah. he, he made interesting points, but he didn't have no solution for me. So what I ended up doing is I started a page mm. called DJ Dab Judah, and I made it private and just put all my smoke, like, excuse me, put a large portion of my smoking content over there until it just became a little bit more loose where people don't c concern much about it. Because, like, I've DJed at Georgia Tech and the University of Georgia and advertised we like Georgia Tech asked me about it, but yeah. Georgia didn't care. Neither one of them cared. Yeah, they pretty much some people understand when the when a DJ or a celebrity's coming in town, they can let them do what they like to do to have fun. I've been in plenty of markets where they don't let smoking happen, but if the right celebrity walked through that door, you know, they're gonna blaze up, nobody's gonna say nothing to them. Now, um, you just came off tour with Wiz, Joey, and uh, Burner, the Good uh, Trip Tour, seven, and you did uh, eight, seven shows in eight days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going from where you guys started to where you are now, how exciting is it to see the progression that you and Burner have made and to see the responses that you're getting um, when you're on these tours with, you know, uh, all these fans? Because I've I seen some of the videos and they're going crazy for Burner, singing all his words, songs to him word for word. And, you know, I'm sure that's got to be a, a great feeling for both of you. <laughs> um, for me, it goes to show how working your situation yeah. Like, you can't never forget up, give up. And as much as I appreciate people who put their heart and, you know, feel like letting a DJ play your record can change your life, there's, yeah. that's no substitution for hard work. I have, there's only but a handful, not even a handful, there's a nice amount, but Burner's not going to go over well in the yep. club. It's not going to turn the party up. But his core fans live and die by him. He's found a way to, not most people have, have He's found somewhere yes. where him and his fans relate at. And in that space, he's like, I don't want to say the god or the guru, but he's heavily respected in that space. So it's interesting to see from, like, the first Cookies t-shirt or the first hoodie, Cookies hoodie I got to it now. And it's a like every time I go to something, corporate cookies, I yeah. realize how corporate it is because, it's 30, 40, 50 yeah. people who now work for this company that I watched him kind of build yeah. 
out of being cut out. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people, they think that it's just the weed industry, so it's just a whole bunch of people being smoked. But, you know, Burner Cookies is all over the United States. Shout out to Michigan. I'm based out of Indianapolis, so it's the Midwest, you know, and you got a chance to experience okay. that. So I know you do the Teflon case now um, as, your, as your product. Um, was it was seeing the success of cookies yeah. kind of what helped you lead into become getting your own product out here? Or what made you decide to do the Teflon cases? Um, first and foremost, mm. I'm a pre-roll. It's not too many Facts. things to put your pre-rolls in yeah. that's not going to break them, that's pocket size, that's durable. So, like, just uh, as a need, okay, for example, on tour, prior to me coming out with a case, we might sit down before a show mm. and roll up 10 joints apiece and put them yeah. in different cups, like solo cups and like this is th this strain and yeah. this is this strain and this is this strain. And it, it, it just was never nothing cool to put them in. And then like at work, I can roll and DJ and not mix a beat, but it's nothing better than to be at work and you just reach over in yeah. your case and you got one ready to go and you just light it. And the, like my joints is mm -hmm. too big for something like this. Like I roll them kind of heavy and this will possibly be yep. This is still cardboard. So for me, it was a need. I felt like people needed the case. And then, like, I'd mm -hmm. rather have a case than my own strength. It's a lot of red tape to having your own case. Um, the profit margins is not what you want it to be yeah. or what most people think it's going to be because there's still yeah. cost to make this product and people undermine what it costs to make it. So this was just me, one, contributing back to the game, and two, this was something I really had to use for. Like, yeah. I use my cases. Like, before the, before I have to work this weekend, I'll have this full with, jo with joints so I can just go out and just roll and, so, them and I just take them. I think they hold about seven to ten joints, uh, depending upon how you roll them. Um, what? How yeah, do you depending on how decide big you like what them. cases you want to do? I see there's a, a lot of different custom cases that are available. Um, is that something that the fans can create the case themselves, or they're already pre-made and they just got to select from the ones that are available? Um, it's in interesting. Yeah, yeah they do trip cool. about it at metal, at, at metal detectors, but I put mine on the tables. Yeah. It's none of your business in there it's too small to hold a weapon so mind your business and maybe i have, have a different yeah you're going through it i'm going through the back door metal detector but i definitely put like going through it, most places i just put mine down is any don't don't you dare open it like my homeboy told me he went to a concert mm -hmm. and they opened it and they took it and I, I wouldn't have went in the concert. Give me my weed back, and I'll try to go through another door. You're not going to take my weed. Especially if it's legal where concert. you're at. Like, if you're in a city where weed is legal, why are you even tripping? You know, um, they're just being difficult. So, but, the, like, for the designs of your cases, I see you've got some pretty dope relationships, Darden and stuff like that. So how did you pick who um, you were partnering with those cases? Um, I did people that... <clears throat> I just met being Burner's DJ, like Kenny Powers. Kenny Powers grows great weed. I'm a huge fan of him, just his growing technique and everything. And, like, when I – okay, if there's been plenty of events that Kenny's came to that we sit down and roll the joints for the – like, Kenny's like me. He'd rather roll 20 for the day and just smoke him as we go along. So, like, him, Michael Blanco, that was an easy one. Um, mm. Vibes is Burner's company. So I did one, of course, with, with his company. I did one with Burner. And then, excuse me, Gas House. Let's go back to Felix Murray. Like, I came up, I, I started with him. So he, he was the first one to be like, yeah, do it. Sure, don't even worry about it. And each company, I got licenses. Oh, that's dope. So I'm official, not just using yeah. their name. Like, they make something off the plate, too. So, yeah, like, it's not, I'm just, you know, we're cool, so I'm going to put your name on it. I, I, I talked to each party and individually and we worked on a game plan not a game plan but percentages and we went from there so i just did the brands i knew and respected and it says a, and a lot about you you keep there. mentioning gas house felix who put you in the game early on and you still are loyal to him you know what i mean a lot of people miss that's what this music industry is really about is the people that you meet early on and years later still having those great relationships because 
you know, they looked out for you early on, and, you know, it, it's a good thing about you. Um, so, so, shout out to my family, Sincere. You know, um, she's the one that set up this interview. How did you and Sincere meet, and what made you guys start uh, working together? Um, I met her just working there. She's always, she was always at the events around town, and then she was one of the few people that just yeah. always reached out to me to say hello. Like, one time, Sincere was like, Tef, what's your cat at? And cash out maybe like fifty bucks for lunch. Like Sincere is always looking out for people she fuck with. I can't even say the DJs or DJs in general. Sincere is just a sweetheart. She's always if she fucks with you and she can make something happen to do some business with you or put some money in your pocket, she's one of them people. So when she hit me like, "Yo, I need you to do blah blah blah," I was like, "Say no more," because like her concern was yeah. she thought I'd be on tour because we do have a summer tour coming up, but. I did it from tour. Like anything, she she's one of the people that if I see her phone, her name on my phone, I'm gonna pick it yeah, up if dope. I can. At least now you said the upcoming out. tour. I seen that uh, you guys are coming to Indianapolis, but can we announce any of the upcoming dates or anything for the fans? Yeah, but the, the, like it, it, um, I think yeah. it's, it's a Live Nation tour, so the you can buy them through Live Nation, but. Yeah, this is a thirty. That tour is thirty three shows in fifty days. Do you like it better when it's compacted like that? So, I see you guys do a lot of those pretty much one day turnarounds, or do you like it better when there's some space between the tours? Um, it's nothing like a good because, like, we had a show Saturday. It's nothing like a good fly into a market, stay, be there a day or two, and come home. Like, there's nothing like a little weekend trip. Because before, like, even this the short tour, before yeah. people could start getting on your nerves and it was going to start bothering you, you was home. Like, this 50-day tour, by about day 30, everybody's going to irritate you. Everything's going to bother you. The littlest things, every like, I usually get a hotel. Oh, wow, to get away from everybody and, mind. you know, have some space. Well, they'll get now, away you're from on everything. I also, I'm going to make you laugh, I never take jeans. Like, summer tours. Yeah. I never take jeans. I don't want to go out. If I'm not working, like this year, I got some after parties, so I'm yeah. going to have to actually work after some shows. But That's like a working, lot of DJs and out. artists that I know. Like, when we're in other markets, the last thing you want to do is go to the club. People are like, you don't want to come party with us? Like, I just got off stage. I just got done working. So me going to the club, it's just it's like another job to me. So, no, I want to go to the hotel. And, you know, I want to relax and have a good time. And on tour, like, you, you do have your time where you have to work. But I feel like tour, you're always on the clock because you're not at your own time. You're not going home to get in your own bed or do what the fuck you want or say, you know what, I'm going to California tomorrow or whatever. Like, you, you're – it's kind of always work because you're never – yeah, back on your own. Now, with schedule. with you being on tour with Burner and Wiz, you know, you gotta imagine the smoking stories are amazing. Like, how do you guys stay focused when you've got the cookie smoke thrower on one end, you've got the Wiz dab on another end, you've got your, you know, the Teflon case with the pre rolls. Like, how do you guys stay focused on make these deadlines because you know there's so much good weed around. I guess. I feel like mm -hmm. we was all potheads before we got into. Uh, our careers or professions yeah. like we smoke but we're all productive potheads who run companies so and it doesn't hurt mm. you're, you're already at the yeah. so you're at work it's just a matter of you having to get off your tour bus and being yeah. dressed to perform or whatever but you you kind of yeah so you got somebody who knocks you got somebody like, knocking much, on the bus and say hey it's your turn you're like oh shit here we go not really. I mean, like 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 we said earlier, it's a whole bunch of hurry up and wait. So you kind of have in mind your showtime. And what time, because that's that besides sound check and fucking what time catering serving food, yeah. that's the hot, like that's what you're there for. So uh, like uh, we, we, we get high, some like, well, let's say we're having a sesh after a while, people will kind of venture off because they're tired of smoking. Yeah, and when say, it's time to go, it's time to go. And I like, was gonna say, yeah, you're right. Like eventually, yeah. you do get tired of smoking. Like you can you can smoke enough, but if you're on on the bus smoking, then you go into the stage and they're handing you joints and stuff like that. So I can imagine that eventually, you're like you know what, I'm good right now. Let me let me just you know do what I gotta do. Yeah, 
let me go get ready for work. Let me go to catering. Maybe I want to shoot to the mall. Like we we yeah. were definitely going to get high, and now everybody's on this hype where we're rolling like worms with the the hatch in the middle. But we there for one yeah. reason that and that's to work. And you, you know, it's never been a situation where. Yeah. Oh, I'm too high. I, I seen work. um, I seen a video you posted uh an after party I think where you pulled out the cookie smoke thrower and two girls you know got got. Well, have have you ever seen somebody who's got that smoke uh, thrower sent to them that they didn't understand what it was or you know they reacted differently because that that that's a great thing if you're a smoker but that's, that puts out a lot of smoke. Um, I feel like because I live somewhere where weed's illegal, but play. Places like that underestimated because yeah. it's not common. West Coast people, places where weed's legal, there's always been little devices to blow more smoke. People been reverse, reverse doing um, reverse engineering like yeah. we, leaf blowers for years. Places where weed is illegal, like here, I pulled it out at the club one time, <laughs> and everybody was like, "Whoa!" Like. We didn't that think it was going to blow yeah. that much smoke. And I think they, like, it, yeah, they underestimate it looks different how much on TV. you got to put into those things, too. They think I'm just going to put a nug in. No, you put up, you put up a lot of uh, a lot of smoke for that. You probably put up, like, the, the, they made it with the smaller bowls, but, like, I got the prototype one. To get a good blow of smoke, you're going to have to put about 10 grams in there. That's anywhere from yeah. fifty to a hundred dollars worth. Now, of with weed. the Teflon, with the Teflon Depending cases, you are you from. have you thought about making them custom made, where you know artists could maybe get their own Teflon case that has their branding on it, or you want to stay more with the corporate levels? Oh, dope! I have a generation now one, and just how how things work. I did one. I asked Drama. And their, actually, really their manager, Lake Show, he was like, yeah, cool, do it. I like your little idea because Lake Show smokes heavy. And I hadn't released it yet because we was going to put it out around Drama's album. And then me and Lake Show talked because he's going to, yeah, Drama yeah, is the DJ true. for the whole tour this summer. He was like, yo, just save them. Oh, wow. We'll do them as merch. So they're going to sell them out of Drama's merch booth. That you're gonna, that's going to be amazing. So I'll have... Dramas that I have generation now is at Dramas booth, and I have probably burners and the vibes oh, one at dope. his one. So I'm super now. Besides the, the tour, tour, where so. can people go get the Teflon case? Is there a website on your Instagram or somewhere they can go to support you at? Yes, um, it's Teflon case www.tephlon. No, case.com. Like, this is pretty much how you spell my and name. Are you thinking about any other future ventures um, in, in the marijuana industry, or you just want to focus more on this case and see how far you can take it with that? Um, and I've heard a lot of people say that, say this, but like in the gold rush, the people who mined yeah. for gold made a lot of money, but the people who sold yeah, picks facts. and shovels made a lot of money too. It's less, it's less. I want to do things that's less red tape. Like, okay, because let's just use having your own strand for an example. Yeah. Let's say I get my own strand in California. Nope. You can't ship weed. So now I got to take the genetics and take it to Michigan. And I got to take the genetic, like find a grower, have them grow it in Michigan. Find a grower in every state, have them grow it. That's way too much red tape to only be getting a couple hundred dollars per pound because it still costs you, the grower, X, Y, Z amount of money. Then whoever we sell it to got to make a profit. So we're not even looking yeah. at a whole bunch of money per pack. And, and it's a whole bunch yeah, of yeah. people you, you got to watch. can't be everywhere at the same time. Whereas I can, just sell ex I can just sell accessories from my door to your door anywhere in the world. So I'm, I'm looking at looking into more accessories, look, just things that smokers need that make everyday life easier. Because like people who really don't smoke, you're like, oh, that's an out toy case. Like, oh, that's right. Yeah. People who smoke is like, yo, I need one of those. Oh, my friend took mine, so I need to go get me two more. Because when somebody see you with it, it's like, oh, shit. So, like, I have people who end up having to order more than one yeah. because they done put theirs down somewhere and somebody done snatched it from them. Because it wasn't the coolest idea to use at a party. 
and you know everybody's rolling up or you know using their little dollar and trying not to you know get the yeah you ready to go I just do this right here <laughs> and then when yeah. that one's finished I do it again and you still rolling up I just smoked three and you rolled up one so it it, it looks pointless to and I love it because you, you, you talked need. about you know the new uh, way to do it is instead of showing up at somebody's house with a bag already have your pre roll ready or like in Atlanta you know there's a lot of strip clubs where they'll let you roll but you spend your whole time rolling instead of enjoying the festivities so why not already have it, you know, ready to go. Yeah, and then, like, just using the party industry. Yeah, yeah you can roll it on the bar. But what if somebody yeah. spills some drink on the bar? And then, real talk, you better put something between you and the, your weed and the bar because yeah, they wipe that bar with all kind of chemicals. Or, you know, trying to hold it and people nudge you or you done roll them and put them in the, 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 the switcher box and the security guard yeah. crushes it being an asshole. Like, it's just so easier that for me to have them roll. So, like, I'd rather take 30 minutes yeah. and put me a five together and go out the house and have, have them kind of have more than I need and just, you know, pull them out at my disposal than every 45 yeah, minutes I've got to go again. over to the bar. And, <laughs> you lose and, like, your high before you can get back to it. For yeah. me, as yeah. a joint smoker, I need a rolling tray. I need a grinder. I need some space. That's way too much. That's dope. Now, for the, the can, for consumer uh, interest, does it help with the smell any? Like, it, it will it cover the smell in any way so people ain't got to worry about that element? I'm, I'm going to keep it all okay. the way funky. No. I'm looking into to some kind of lining because I've heard a few people complain about that. But in initially thinking about it, and I don't even live in a place where weed's legal. I mm. thought about it from a legal market standpoint. Because right now, at the country, yeah. we're, we're probably 50-50 are legal states, illegal states. So I just thought of it from, or even if, if you're not legal, it's decriminalized where they ain't fucking with you with it. So I thought about it from that aspect. And But I've had people say, yo, yeah. oh, you're just a liner to do... The problem so with the liner would be it, it would intoxicate it would infect your 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 you know if you got it in there too long and you're huffing on that now maybe put it like a ziploc that has your branding on it so you slide them in the ziploc but yeah I mean it has great possibility and like you said if you're going to be in the accessories market you just build off it versus the cases now you got a bag that you can put to give you that opportunity and you know different maybe papers and different things like that. So, like, I'm working on a different size. I'm working on some with pockets in it. Like, yeah. this was the 1.0. The 2.0 is coming soon. And then after we get the 2.0, we're working on the 2.5. Like, as you do it, you learn more about it and kind of figure out where you can go differently. So I, I, I'm fully into That's dope. My and then I know you're a busy person, so I'm not going to take too much more of your time. But do you have any advice for other DJs? I work, shout out to DJ Many Faces, Jumped in the Life. I got a lot of DJs I work with. Any advice on how they can go about, you know, becoming, you know, like you said, the goal is to get with the major artists and be the tour DJ or stuff like that. So any advice you can give a, a up and coming DJ? Hmm. Um, okay. <clears throat> One. Yeah. Don't get booked because you're the lowest. Like, you, you do have to start somewhere, but your $200 might be taking $500 yeah. out of someone else's pocket. And even at the lowest, I'm going to want a yeah. lower price somewhere down the line. So even if I'm at your bottom, if I do it for 10 years or five years or two years or six months, I'm, I might want you to come down some more. So keep that in mind. And then somebody put my, what I was going to say next. Yeah. Practice, practice, Definitely. practice. Seriously, practice, 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 practice. On my mirror, in my early days of my career, I had mm. 40 sticky notes in different color oh, markers wow. that all said practice. Like, it was enough space to see me, and then all around my mirror, it said practice. Script, cursive, graffiti. Red, black, yellow. That's what a lot of motivational speakers practice. tell people to do. It's the, it's the cheat code. Put stuff around your room. Practice. Pra so everywhere you see it, your mind thinks practice. So then when you got a free moment, you run into the turntables. You're like, it, it just conditions you that way. Um, if anybody want to you know, reach out to you or build with you, get the Teflon cases besides the website, what's the best means to reach out to you and um, trying to uh, uh, connect with you? 
Um, I try to answer DMs. There's no way to get it get get to it all and to know who's serious. Um, and I, I, I don't I'm not saying this to sound like yeah. a jerk. Be persistent. Like you you you're still trying to build with a stranger. Certain people I want to build with, I have to be persistent. I have to stay on their top. I had to make the case and bring it to them so they could be like, oh, that's dope. I, do, I couldn't run to them like, yo, I got this idea. If I can get five. Nah, here yeah, you go. Proof, proof of your, concept. Your case. So, like, you, you, you kind of, you, you, yeah, be persistent. Know what you want to talk about. Like, everybody just doesn't have time to shoot the shit. Know what you want from me so i can let you yeah. know if i do you think you do uh for artists um does it help if they do a drop for you or if they send you the dub plates and stuff like that with the records or is it just building that relationship that's more important to you um one i don't do the clubs too much like for far as me personally where i'm at in my career i don't do the clubs too much i literally at the gigs i have mm. play what i I want to. So if I like it, I'm a play it. I don't. I'm not. I'm at a point in my career where the gigs don't require me that that play the yeah. the last hottest twenty songs if I don't want to. So it, I, I'm in a different place personally. But to build with DJs, the best thing I could always suggest, and I know you can't do it to them all, is one work your work it yourself yeah. and working on getting it hot without trying yeah. to sell it to me as being hot. And two is yeah. build with who you can. If you're if you're calling yourself being an artist, I don't care where where you're from. There's some yeah. DJs in that town that's running the town, and they may be assholes. They may be hard to get at or hard to get with. But you're gonna be like that once you work your way up. Everybody's not gonna be able to knock on your door and ask you for that. Just when you when you become that popping artist you're working to be. So just keep that in mind. And like I always tell people, you know how many people are. Yeah, asking everybody. For the same thing you're asking for. Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants a club spin. Funny story before I go. Yearly inspection at my place. They come do the fire inspection. I got a little baby plaque right there. So it's the dude from the leasing office and the two people from fire and safety. Dude from the leasing office says, yo, where did you get that plaque from? Did you have to order it or is it yours? And yes, I should have yes. just said I I ordered it. I was like, nah, they oh, you know man. they gave it to all the DJs. Every time I see him now, he wants to like he stopped me once and asked me, could he give me some music? And I've seen him since yeah. then. He's asked me, have I like, li listened to it yet? And so just be persistent, but also just remember everybody wants the same thing. And like I told him, I don't even do the club no more. So. Which your which because he asked me how much does it cost for me to play a record and I was like yeah I don't I'm not even I can't even play your record your money to yeah. play a record. at a concert at a concert and I don't mean this to no disrespect it's not worth my legend at this yeah because if you're at the concert chance. and you play a record the, that the, the fans concert, don't know they're gonna they're gonna be turned off or the artist you're the DJ for is gonna be mad at you and say. Yo, this is not that time. I want you to play my stuff or play somebody else on this bill. It, you know, it's kind of counterproductive almost. Yeah, because like I get booked to DJ before in the middle of concert. So there I can't like I can. But again, these are not your normal paying gig. These are real good paying gig. I'm not That's risking my job to make you pop. I mean, this is... I, I, I'm not, I, I don't mean this is no disrespect for my faster. And if I believe in it enough, I'll try it. I don't care. It's only 30 seconds. It's only a minute. But I'm not yeah. there to break records. Um, There's a couple songs I play before I bring Burner out. I'm here on, there, on his yeah. time. I'm not there to break records. <clears throat> but I can talk you up. I can put you on my gram. I can use your song in, in a reel. There's other ways to help you, but 
Steve, which and, and that's right great now, game you just gave. Game. Not all DJs are there to break a record. Some DJs are solidified and have a reputation and already have a career that they don't have to test the record. They're just playing the records their friends have given them. Like you said, Burnager, you know, you have Burner, so he's giving you dope records. You've got Wiz Khalifa, you're getting, you know, new songs from him. So you don't have the – it's not in your job description to be a record breaker, so to speak, because you're already established DJ, touring the world on tour doing so. I, I, and I, I've said this before. I don't, mm. I've never considered myself a record breaker. That's not what I'm paid yeah. to do. I get paid to rock apart. And, and I have to stay true to what it is that I do and what I'm being paid for now. Is it my job and my duty to pass it on and teach one and, and, and bring someone else up? Absolutely. But like Cannon pick me, you pick and choose. I can't do it for everybody. There's not enough time to do it for everybody. But like you said, Cannon picked you doing. because you were in the room where you were supposed to be already. You were already working. It wasn't like you were a stranger off the street that said, hey, Cannon, help me. No, you were doing the work yourself. And a lot of times that's what it takes. When people see you doing the work, then they'll want to help you because they see you're doing what's supposed to be going on. I well, pretty This is true. So yeah, our this, yeah. this state this you know. Well, I definitely appreciate hungry. the opportunity tonight. Anything else you want to let the people know before we get out of here, and I'll let you uh get back to your night. Um, <laughs> stay high and hydrated. Smoking all that good weed. Make sure you drink some water. I be I be making people pass out. Or seeing people pass out out here. And we'll yeah, a lot of people don't know that water. hydration is so important when you're smoking because it it can mess you up if you ain't, if you ain't hydrated. All right, man. Well, I appreciate the opportunity true. tonight. You have a great night, fam. Salute. I appreciate